Hello and welcome once again uh, to a discussion on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is part 2. In our last discussion, uh, we looked at some of the things that were taking place here in the United States of America that were pointing towards uh, some signs of some end time prophecy being fulfilled in our time. Now, these are not tribulation events. We are not in the tribulation right now. We're not in the great tribulation. Um, the rapture of the church has not yet occurred. Antichrist has not yet been revealed. Uh, today, we're going to look at the scripture that deals with this, but we have seen what we called, what my former pastor, who is now home with the Lord, uh, what he would often refer to as a commercial, events showing us, lead-in events showing us uh, of things, or revealing things that are to come, uh, sort of precursors, uh, whereas we know that there are going to be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places, wars, rumors of wars. The Lord Jesus warns us of all of these things. Well, we see a lot of that now, and these things on the increase. Uh, we see a lot of other things. We see the hearts of men waxing cold. We see a lot of things that the Apostle Paul uh, himself prophesied in 2 Timothy chapter 3 regarding the, the hearts of men and the behavior of mankind in general. Uh, today we're going to look at the falling away of the church, which is really a twofold event, or maybe we might want to call it more of a two pronged event. It has two parts. One of the parts is people in general. The, the, the general world falling away from the church system. That is, no longer desiring morality. And, and this, of course, is what the Apostle Paul speaks of in 2 Timothy chapter 3, among other places, where he talks about people having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. We also have another thing that the Lord Jesus warns of in what we are now uh, in, which is called the Laodicean Age, which is apathy. This is another type of falling away within the saved church body, but it's the church body that is not growing. It's not learning. It's not working. It's not evangelizing. It's not heeding the Great Commission. Uh, it, it's stagnant. And the Lord said to the Laodicean church, because you're neither warm nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth, literally vomit you out of my mouth. The Lord is very, very displeased in Revelation chapter 3 with this church back in the first century AD and prophetically with the, the church of that age, which is our church today. Now, we're not speaking of individual churches, but we're speaking collectively of the church. And we see today that the church has made a move, by and large, many people calling themselves Christians, moving towards prosperity, moving towards commercialism, moving towards uh, materialism, moving towards things that have really very little to do with the gospel and the furtherance of the kingdom of Christ and having a lot more to do with building up of themselves, building up of the individual, building up of self-esteem, building up of wealth, all of these things which the Lord Jesus basically told us not to look after. We're, we're to look after the things of heaven. He told us that where you know, where our treasure is, that's where our hearts will be also, and our treasure is laid up for us in heaven, not here on earth. 
So we're going to look today at 1 Thessalonians, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, specifically verses 3 through 12, but we'll read verses 1 through 12 and just discuss as exegetically as we go through and look at what's going to take place from roughly from the time of the rapture through the revelation of the Antichrist, the Antichrist, because everybody who's against Christ is an Antichrist. That's literally what the term means. And the Apostle John writes about that in his general epistles. But even more so, we're going to talk about the Antichrist and what allows him to come upon the scene and why he is not yet on the scene, nor will be until the church is physically taken away in the rapture. So last time we talked on this topic, we saw some things that are leading us or pointing us to the fact that that the rapture is imminent, could happen now, could happen before this video is over, could happen tomorrow, could happen in a month, a year, 10 years. Uh, we don't know the timeline, but we do know the event line. And there's nothing that prevents it, and the things that point to it are ever increasing. So let's take a look at First or Second Thessalonians, and we'll begin with chapter 2, verse 1. And Paul writes to this church, and a little background on the church at Thessalonica. They were a heavily persecuted church. So when Paul wrote the first book, uh, or his first letter to the Thessalonians, he was writing for reassurance, reassurance of the resurrection, reassurance of the Lord's return, reassurance of eternal life. And this is where he reveals to us the events of the rapture in verses 13 through 18 of chapter 4. And then he continues on with exhortations in chapter 5 of that same uh, first epistle, where we are told things like rejoice evermore. And uh, we're told just to, just to continue on, continue in the faith, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, continue in the work uh, where you've been called to work. These are the, this is the mindset. You know, don't fear, don't fret, don't don't weary of well doing. This is the whole this is the whole mindset through the message to the Thessalonians because even though there's a lot of persecution, even though there's a lot of despair, even though there's a lot of trial and tribulation now, this is not the great tribulation. And there is glory to be gained. There is glory at the end of the race. So second second Thessalonians is a follow up to that and now he's going to expound even more and get into eschatology or end time prophecy where he's going to show them and, and expound uh, upon these events and give them even more reason to glory and provide some more detail of those times. So he writes beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2, now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that ye not that ye be not soon shaken in mind or tro or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ and that would be the day of the Lord spoken of by Daniel, by the prophet Daniel, is at hand, that day of the Lord. Let no man deceive you by any means, and this is where our text begins. For that day shall not come, shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now that falling away must take place first, and that means that the church begins to shirk her duties, begins to 
fall away in the sense that the church is no longer as faithful as she once was, and that people who actually are outside of the church are no longer going to show interest or going to show lacking, waning interest in becoming saved, in, in having morality in their lives, in respecting godliness. In fact, all of the opposite things that we would expect of a moral and just society will take place. People will actually attack morality. They'll not only shun it, but they'll openly attack it. And they will hate those, and, and they will degrade those, and, uh, and deface those that are, um, and, and defame those who are moral and just and seeking to follow righteously after God. The falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. There's not a lot of translation needed there. That is Satan's man on earth. That's going to be Antichrist. That is his, that is his false Christ. Of course, he's going to be received by the masses um, the same way that uh, many Many people in politics and in religion and in entertainment and so forth are received today. They're received with wonderful accolades, and they're as rotten as can be. And any Christian worth his salt, any Christian who follows the Holy Spirit, any Christian who stays in the Word of God, any Christian who heeds the Lord's call, he immediately recognizes what a dangerous person or what a troublemaking person uh, that these individuals are, that each of these individuals is. Uh, however, uh, to the average person, you know, this person may live a lavish life. They may be a, a handsome man or a beautiful woman physically, and uh, they may be striking or stunning in their ability to attract people. They may speak eloquently or whatever. And so, oh my goodness, the world is just drawn to them. Well, this is the type of person the Antichrist is going to be. He's going to be a very fascinating individual. People are going to be drawn to him. He's going to, he's going to have amazing powers and amazing abilities to, to, just, to just draw people to him. But he's going to be false. You see, people won't People will have rejected Christ for so long that they won't recognize the truth. He, he can be blatantly evil. He could have a trail of dead bodies trailing his life through the years to get where he is. But nobody will care. He, he, could, he could practice all kinds of immorality in his life. And people will even see that maybe as a good thing, something to be lauded. Uh, because a lot of that goes on today. We have people in leadership. We have people in entertainment. We have, we, we have people that are, that, are, that are raised up on a pedestal for living lifestyles like this by many in our world. Verse 4, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And this is the seat that Antichrist will take in the end days. He will actually sit in the temple of God in Jerusalem. That will be his seat of power. This is one of the references we find for that. Right here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that will be his seat of power. And, and he'll position himself so that if somebody doesn't think that he is actually God, as in the God of the universe, they will certainly treat him as their God. Have you noticed how many people treat the government as their God today? No matter what the government says, no matter how silly and how outlandish it is today, they treat the government as their God. And whatever the government says goes. The same people who back in the 80s and the 90s abhorred government, said, fear your government, said, you know, 
re respect respect your leaders, but fear your government. They have all these different kinds of slogans and so forth. They're in lockstep with them now. I'll give you an example, and I'm sorry if some of you don't like it, but facts don't lie. We're told about all these people that are going into hospitals that are sick, that are dying of COVID. Walk outside of your house, look around, all these people out there wearing masks, doing all this social distancing, everything else. How many dead bodies do we see in the street, folks? How many people do we see wrecking their cars because they suddenly keel over and, and get sick and die? Uh, how, how, how crowded are our hospitals really as your local hospital? Folks, we're being told one thing, but an entirely different thing we, we witness an entirely different thing. This is just one example. I, I could just go right down the list and, and list them. This is just one example. Okay? But because we have been told to do a thing, and because it affects our personal health, or so we think, we run around in fear. We just, we just, we're afraid. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear because... Fear has torments. Fear has torments. Our whole nation, our whole world is being tormented right now. Do you know that famine, pestilence, uh, illness, these are things that will come during the Great Tribulation, and they will be real. It won't be a fraction of a percentage of a particular demographic that is ser becomes seriously ill or dies. It won't be something where the vast majority of people can continue on with their lives. It will be thirds of the world dying at a time, quarter of the world dying at a time, half of the world dying at a time, all right, over these various types of things that take place through the, as we're told in the book of Revelation. And we're scared. The Bible tells us that the wicked pursue, the wicked run or the wicked flee when none pursueth after. You know, we see that right now in our society. These are more commercials. Okay, I listed some things about voter fraud the last time we spoke. But these kinds of behaviors in human beings, these are just more examples of what we see. These are more commercials telling us what it's going to be like. If we collectively as a society are this afraid, afraid of something that is pretty much just media hype, what's going to happen when people really do start dropping dead? One out of every three people, one out of every four people every other person. What kind of chaos is the world going to fall into then? Verse 5. Remember ye not that when I, when I was with you, that was, Paul was with the Thessalonians, I told you these things. So Paul's reiterating something that he's already made them aware of. Now he's reassuring them of what he has made them aware of. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. This is a key verse right here. Very short verse, but very key. Now you know. Now you know. You know what is here, or more specifically, who is here that withholds or restrains that the Antichrist may be revealed in his time. Paul, uh, uh, Paul saying, now is not yet the time. You know what it is. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is now present. And while God in the person of the Holy Spirit is present in his believers, we folks, we are the barrier. We pray. We lift up holy hands. We lift up our, our hearts. We raise up our prayers, our petitions. We pray on behalf of ourselves, our families, our nation, our leaders, we pray these prayers and we lift them up and God 
and God receives them as odors, as essences. These are sweet-smelling savors to him, as, as if they are sacrifices, because prayer is a sacrifice that God accepts. Not burnt offerings anymore, but prayer is a sacrifice that God accepts. And make no mistake about it, fervent prayer is a sacrifice. It's not passive. Prayer is very active. And prayer is something that we owe to God and we should give to him on a regular basis. And when we pray, we intercede and we stand in that gap between Satan's arrival or Satan's man on earth, the Antichrist, arriving and the, and, and, and the Lord's allowing it to do so. And the Lord knows this already, but his foreknowledge does not prevent our free will and our desire to give everybody one more chance, just one more chance, just one more chance to turn, to repent, to come to Christ. Moving on. For the mystery of iniquity, and here's a mention of mystery. I could spend a lot of time on this, but I don't want to belabor that point in this video. Maybe later we'll talk about some of the mysteries that are revealed during the church age that were hidden during the Old Testament time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And that's the other bookend of verse 6. For now, the Holy Spirit, present in believers, restrains Antichrist from coming onto the scene. But there will be a moment, there will be a time, when believers will be taken out. And that's when Antichrist will come onto the scene. People that become saved subsequent to the believers being removed, to the church being removed, will be saved through the work of the 144,000 evangelists spoken of in the book of Revelation who go out among all the world. Everything will revert back to the Jews, which is it's beautiful. It's amazing how the Lord keeps his promises. I've said this before in other messages, don't belittle Judaism and the Jews in any way. God made his promises to the Jews. Right now, his fulfillment of that promise is through Christians who are grafted in and Jews who accept Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The promise to Abraham never died. It never quit. It continues on. It just has continued to be passed through to those who are now saved in Christ Jesus. It's still afforded to every Jew who wants to accept Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. When the rapture occurs, there will be 144,000 Jewish evangelists, and there will be two witnesses for three and a half years preaching very boldly about the sins of the world. They're not going to be very popular, but they're going to be preaching the truth, and a lot of people are going to hear. Through the work out of Israel, multitudes are going to be saved. But it's going to be it's going to revert back to the Jews. Beautiful thing, beautiful. Oh, end time prophecy, end time eschatology, the study of last things. The Bible is just oh, it's just so rich, it's so rich with these things. And Paul, I'm sure had I'm sure taught the Thessalonians much of this, much of at least much of what he knew at the moment. And I don't know what Paul knew. I don't know what Paul knew that John was, things were later revealed to John in Revelation. I don't know how much of that perhaps had been revealed to Paul that he had maybe shared with others. There were obviously parts because there's a lot that overlaps and there's a lot that crosses over. But the entire picture was laid out for the Apostle John and he gave us a, a, a phenomenal writing. The Lord just blessed that man in an incredible way, raptured him up to heaven and he wrote two chapters on it. Chapters 4 and 5, what an amazing, what an amazing, the Bible is just an incredible book. The Bible is just incredible, incredible. The Lord has just given us his best blessing by his word. His written word, the Bible, his spoken word, those who tell us, and as we share his spoken word, 
and his living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, capital W there, referring to a, pro a proper noun, meaning referring to a person, which will, in this case will be the Antichrist, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And that is discussed in Revelation chapter 20. Okay. Um, the Antichrist and the false prophet are destroyed in the first go-round. And then we have Satan himself, who is loosed for a little season after the thousand years, after the millennial kingdom, and then he gets destroyed. But the Lord Jesus Christ, we're, we're told all the way back in, in Genesis chapter 3, we're told all the way back there, that the descendant of Adam and Eve, the promised one, well, Satan will bruise his heel. And that happened that day on the cross at Calvary. But he's going to bruise his head. He's going to make Jesus stumble for a moment. And that's where he died. That's where he sacrificed himself and died for all the sins of the world. Literally the sin of the world. But Jesus will bruise his head, blow, strike him a mortal blow. And that will happen. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. You know, it's no wonder that Jesus, Jesus told us, because he showed us in many signs and wonders, that he was Messiah because he was the only one that could do the things that he did. And he showed us how many times he had the power over death, especially at the end. Well, first raising Lazarus after four days, but then finally raising himself on the third day. He was the only one in the Bible ever to raise himself from the dead after three days. And we're told many times, we're told both before in the Old Testament and in the New Testament about his resurrection because he could not be held by death. We see Jesus' power even over death. Satan does not have this power. Satan cannot create life, and he cannot resurrect the dead. And he certainly cannot resurrect himself from the dead. So we see Jesus' power. Paul also says, the Jews seek after a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but I preach Christ and him crucified. Okay. To the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, or the Gentiles, foolishness. He would go on to say that he preaches the foolishness of Christ. He preaches the foolishness of Christ. Right? Because some would refer, as they do today, to the gospel as foolishness. It, it couldn't be proven. It couldn't be explained scientifically. It couldn't be explained logically. Uh, and so, and, and, and so it, it couldn't make any sense. It didn't matter that it happened. It didn't matter that there were above 500 witnesses at one time that saw Jesus alive after his crucifixion. It didn't matter that all of this eyewitness testimony is on record. The only thing that mattered was that there were just many people that didn't want to accept it for any one of a number of reasons, but it basically came down to it, it would change the way they had to live their lives and to whom they were responsible for living the way they lived. And that, tr that still holds true today. That truth still lives today. John chapter 3, verses 18 through 21 tell us, people choose to go to hell because they want to live the life they choose rather than receiving the Lord and Savior and allowing him by his Holy Spirit to live through.
through them, which is a far more glorious way to live and a far more wonderful way to live. Verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, and in the Greek, literally, that means that they should believe the lie. This, this is a very important passage here, these two verses, it's because notice this takes place after the rapture has occurred and the revelation and, and, and the tribulation it has begun. What this is telling us is that those who have been preached to, those who have been witnessed to, those who have been given a clear picture, those who have been called, literally those who have been called, for many are called, but few are chosen. And Jesus spoke on that at length throughout the Gospels. Not one, but several parables. For many are called, but few are chosen. Here we see that those who have been clearly given the gospel, who clearly understand the gospel, they clearly understand their responsibility, they clearly understand what Jesus did, why he did it, how he did it, and what they need to do in response to it and reject it. I'll do it later. When I get closer to death, when I get further along in life, when I've lived my life and enjoyed and gotten out of it, what I want, and there's the self-will factor from John chapter 3, verses 18, 19 through 21. You know, then maybe I'll then maybe I'll take the plunge and go, you know, go live for Jesus, sell out for Jesus. Go go live for Jesus. And then go out and get hit by a car tomorrow and it's all over. Go out tomorrow and have a heart attack and drop dead. Go out tomorrow and uh, have a ruptured brain aneurysm and not be able to think for yourself, be a living vegetable for the rest of your life. The Bible tells us now is the acceptable time, now is the day of salvation. We may not have another chance. Well, here is hard evidence. If you cross that threshold, if the church is raptured up, and you have been witnessed to by a believer in Christ, and I'm talking now to people who have not been saved or to those who have someone in their lives who has not been saved that you've witnessed to. They cross that threshold. If you cross that threshold from pre-rapture into tribulation, and that witnessing has been done and received and understood, you're not going to get another chance. It'll be like when Pharaoh's heart was hardened in Egypt so that he could not do the right thing. God hardened his heart. Pharaoh didn't harden his own heart. God hardened his heart. And we said, well, that's not fair. Pharaoh didn't have a chance. Well, sure he did. Sure he did. Pharaoh had a lot of chances. Pharaoh did not want to follow God, so God hardened his heart. Well, here's the same thing. God says, here's your deadline. You cross the line. You have this knowledge, and you cross the line, there's no going back. It's like the gate closes, and you can't go back. Now, there are still going to be tens, probably hundreds of millions of people who have never heard or received the gospel in that fashion, because we know there's going to be a multitude of people that are going to be saved through the evangelical work of the Jewish nation in during the tribulation period. So we know there's going to be a lot of people getting saved. But the church age is done. That dispensation, I know some people don't like that word, but there are too many dispensations in the Bible to ignore them. That dispensation is over. Period. Verse 12. That they might that they might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And there's the reason.
You see, God's not obliged to do anything. He's God. Everything he does is right. Everything he does is true. Everything he does is pure. But you know, in his grace, in his wisdom, and in his desire to give us the whole truth, he tells us the what's and what, where's and why for it. Uh, where for, try that again. He tells us the what's and wherefores. Okay? He not only tells us what will happen, he tells us when it'll happen, and he tells us why it'll happen. He says, look, get saved now, because when the tribulation happens, you're not going to get a second chance. And he said, and you know what's going to happen? He said, you're going to be eternally condemned because you had your chance and I told you when that chance was going to end. So every base is covered. And the amazing thing is God is not obliged to do any of that. He's not required to do any of that. He chose out of his love to give us all of that information. And as believers, that should compel us all the more to continue in faith, to share his word, because we shouldn't want to see anybody perish and not have eternal life. And the challenge now is in these last days, this is the hardest time to witness. Not because we're going to be beat up, shut down. Physically, we're not, we really here in the United States, we're not in a lot of danger. Now, once in a while we might be, but for the most part, we're really not. Not like South, not, not like, I'm sorry, not like North Korea, where somebody finds you with a Bible and you're dead. Not like a lot of other third world countries that I read about through Voice of the Martyrs and so forth. We don't have those issues here. The hardest thing for us is just to get somebody to listen. This is, please listen. You just have to pray hard and share when you can and pray that the Holy Spirit is working. Friends, I pray that you've taken this message to heart. I, I pray that it's been a blessing. And uh, I, I ask that you would read both of the books of Thessalonians, First and Second Thessalonians. I'm planning on doing a commentary on them in uh, the upcoming year. And um, I, I'm just, I just ask that you would spend some time in those and realize Paul's passion for this persecuted church and revealing to them some of the great mysteries surrounding the church, both present and prophetic future. Until next time, stay in his word and stay true to his word. In Christ's undying love, amen.